Hey everyone, Ms. Garcia here with another day of distance learning and another day of our continuation of our novel study of the one and only Ivan. Sorry my cover is a little old guys. I should tell you that it's one of my favorites. I know I've said it before, but it really is a great book. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Last video, uh, we left off on the temporary human. That was the video that composed um, part five of our book study. So today we're going to go ahead and move on to the chapters titled Hunger. And we're going to move all the way to another Ivan. So the chapters for this video, which is video six of our book study, are going to be uh, on hunger all the way to another Ivan. So follow along either with your book or just enjoy the reading, guys. We're about to get started. Again, this is part six of our book study. Hunger. Hunger. In my new life as a human, I was well tended. I ate lettuce leaves with Thousand Islands dressing and caramel apples and popcorn with butter. My belly ballooned. But hunger, like food, comes in many shapes and colors. At night, Laying alone in my poo pajamas, I felt hungry for the skill touch of a grooming friend, for the cheerful grunts of a play fight, for the easy safety of my, of my nearby troop foraging through the shadows. Remember what happened to Tag? I told myself. Don't think about the jungle. Still, sometimes I lay awake wishing for the warmth of another just like me, asleep in a night nest of tender prayer plant leaves. I liked having sips of soda poured into my mouth like a bubbling waterfall. But every now and then, I longed to search for a tender stalk of arrowroot to feel the tease of a mango just out of reach. Still life. Still life. One day, Helen came home with something large and flat, wrapped in brown paper. Look what I bought today, she said excitedly as she tore off the paper. A painting to go over the living room couch. Fruit in a bowl, Max said with a shrug. Big deal. This is fine art. It's called a still life, Helen explained, and I think it's lovely. I dashed over to examine the painting, marveling at the colors and shapes. See, said Max's wife, Ivan likes it. Ivan likes to roll up poop and throw it at squirrels, Max said. I couldn't take my eyes off of the apples and bananas and grapes in the picture. They look so real, so inviting, so edible. I reached out to touch a grape and Helen slapped my hand. Bad boy, Ivan, don't touch. She jerked her thumb at Mac. Honey, go get a hammer and a nail, would ya? While Mac and Helen were busy in the living room, I wandered into the kitchen. A cake covered in thick chocolate frosting sat on the counter. I like cake, love it in fact, but it wasn't eating I was thinking about. It was painting. The frosting, packed, the, fr the frosting picked and dipped like waves on a tiny pond. It looked rich and gooey, dark and smooth. It looked like mud. I scooped up a handful of frosting. I scooped up another. I headed to the refrigerator door. It was perfect. An empty white waiting canvas. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The frosting wasn't as easy to work with as jungle mud. It was stickier and of course more tempting to eat. But I kept at it. I scraped off every last bit of that frosting. I may have eaten a little cake too. I don't remember what I was trying to paint. A banana most likely? I suppose I knew I was going to get in trouble. But at that moment, I just didn't care. I wanted to make something anything 
the way I used to. I wanted to be an artist again. Uh-oh, punishment. Punishment. I soon learned that humans can screech even louder than monkeys. After that, I was never allowed in the kitchen. Babies. Babies. Back in those days, the big top mall was smaller. It had a pony ride, a wooden train that bustled around the parking lot, a few bedraggled parrots, and a surly spider monkey. But when Mac brought me, a baby gorilla dressed in a crisp tuxedo, to the mall, everything changed. People came from far and wide to have their pictures taken with me. They brought me blocks and a toy guitar. They held me in their laps. Once I even held a baby in mine. She was small and slippery. Bubbles flowed from her lips. She squeezed my fingers. Her rear was puffy with padding. Her legs bowed like bent twigs. I made a face. She made a face. I grunted. She grunted. I was so afraid she would fall that I squeezed her tightly and her mother yanked her away. I wonder if my mother ever worried about dropping us. We always held on, but that's easier to do when your mother is furry. Human babies are an ugly lot, but their eyes are like our baby eyes. Too big for their faces and for the world. Beds. beds. One day, after many weeks of loud talking, Helen packed a bag and slammed the front door and never came back. I don't know why. I never know of why, the why of humans. That night, I slept with Mac in his bed. Hmm. My old nests were woven of leaves and sticks and shaped like this like his bathtub, cool green cocoons. Mag's bed, like mine, was flat, hot, without sticks or stars. Still, he made a sleeping sound like the rumble my father used to make when all was well, a sound from deep inside his belly. My place. My place. Mac grew sullen. I grew bigger. I became what I was meant to be. Too large for chairs, too strong for hugs, too big for human life. I tried to stay calm, to move with dignity. I did my best to eat daintily. But human ways are hard to learn, especially when you're not a human. When I saw my new domain, I was thrilled. And who wouldn't have been? It had no furniture to break, no glasses to smash, no toilets to drop Max keys into. It even had a tire swing. I was relieved to have my own place. Somehow, I didn't realize I'd be here quite so long. Now I drink Pepsi, eat old apples, watch reruns on TV. But many days, I forget what I'm supposed to be. Am I a human? Am I a gorilla? Humans have so many words, more than they truly need. Still, they have no name for what I am. 9,876 Ruby is finally asleep. I watch her chest rise and fall. Bob too is snoring. But my mind is still racing. For perhaps the first time ever, I've been remembering. It's an odd story to remember, I have to admit. My story has a strange shape, a stunted beginning, and an endless middle. I count all the days I've lived with humans. Gorillas, 
count as well as anyone, although it's not a particularly useful skill to have in the wild. I've forgotten so many things, and yet I always know precisely how many days I've been in my domain. I take one of the magic markers Julie gave me. I make an X, a small one, on my painted jungle wall. I make more X's and more. I make an X for every day of my life with humans. <laughs> my marks look like this. The rest of the night, I mark the days. And when I'm done, my wall looks like this. And so on, until there are 9,876 X's marching across my wall like a parade of ugly insects. A visit. A visit. It's almost morning when I hear steps. It's Mac. He has a sharp smell. He weaves as he walks. He stands next to my domain. His eyes are red. He is staring out the window at the empty parking lot. Ivan, my man, he mumbles. Ivan. He presses his forehead against the glass. We've been through a lot, you and me. A new beginning. A new beginning. We don't see Mac for two days. When he returns, he doesn't talk about Stella. Mac says he is anxious to teach Ruby some tricks. He says the billboard is bringing in more visitors. He says it's time for a new beginning. All afternoon and into the evening, Mac works with Ruby. Ruby's feet are looped with rope so that she cannot run. A heavy chain hangs off her neck. Mac shows her Stella's ball, her pedestal, her stool. He introduces her to Snickers. When Ruby obeys Mac, he gives her a cube of sugar or a bit of dried apple. When she doesn't, he yells and kicks at the sawdust. When George and Julia arrive, Mac is still training Ruby. Julia sits on a bench and watches them. She draws a little, but mostly she keeps her eyes on Ruby. Bob watches too. He's hiding in the corner of my domain under not tag. It's raining outside and Bob does not like damp feet. Ruby drudges behind Mac, her head drooping endlessly. They circle the ring. Sometimes Mac slaps her flank with his hand. Suddenly Ruby jerks to a stop. Mac pulls the chain hard, but Ruby refuses to move. Come on, Ruby, Mac is almost pleading. What is your problem? She's exhausted, I say to myself. That's the problem. Mac groans. <sighs> Idiot elephant. Idiot human, Bob mutters. Walk, Ruby, I say, although I know she's too far, to, too far away to hear me. Do what he says. Walk, Mac commands. Now! Ruby doesn't walk. She plops her rump on the sawdust floor. I think maybe she's tired, Julia says. Mac wipes his forehead with the back of his arm. Yeah, I know. We're all tired. He pushes Ruby with the heel of his boot. She ignores him. Oh my God, my hair. <laughs> she ignores him. George looks over from the food court where he is wiping off tables. <laughs> where he is wiping off tables. Mac, he yells. Maybe you should call it a day. I'll close up. Mac yanks on Ruby's chain. She's as anchored as a tree trunk.
he pulls harder and falls to his knees. That does it, Max says. He brushes sawdust off his jeans. I am through playing around. Max stomps off to his office. When he returns, he is carrying a long stick. The gleaming hook on, his, on its end is almost beautiful, like a silver moon. It's a claw stick. Mag pokes Ruby with a sharp point. Not hard, just a touch. I can tell he wants to see how much it can hurt. I growl low in my throat. Ruby doesn't budge. She is a gray, unmoving boulder. She closes her eyes, and for a moment, I wonder if she might have fallen asleep. I'm warning you, Max says. He breathes out. He stares at the ceiling. Ruby makes a huffing sound. Fine, Max says. You want to play it that way? He draws back the claw stick. No, Julia cries. I'm not going to hurt her, Max says. I just want to get her attention. Bob snarls. Max swings. The hook slices the air just a few inches above Ruby's head. See why you don't want to mess with me, Max says. He draws back the claw stick again. Now move! Ruby jerks her head, flinging her trunk toward Mac. She makes a noise that sends the sawdust scattering. It makes my glass shiver. It is the most beautiful mad I have ever heard. Ruby's trunk slaps into Mac. I don't see exactly where she strikes him, somewhere below his stomach, I think. And I know he must be uncomfortable because Mac drops a claw stick and falls down to the ground and curls into a ball and howls like a baby. Direct hit, Bob says. Poor Mac. Poor Mac. Mac groans. He stumbles to his feet and hobbles off towards his office. Ruby watches him. Watches him leave. I can't read her expression. Is she afraid? Relieved? Proud? When Mac is gone, George and Julia lead Ruby from the ring. It's okay, baby. It's okay, Julia says, stroking Ruby's head. They settle Ruby in her domain and make sure she has fresh water and food. Before long, Ruby's dozing. Dad, Julia asks as George locks Ruby's iron door. Do you think Mac would ever hurt Ruby? I don't think so, Jules, George says. At least, I hope not. Maybe we could call someone. George scratch, scratches his chin. <laughs> I wish I could help Ruby, but I wouldn't know how. I mean, who would I call? The elephant cops? Besides, George looks down. I need this job, Jules. We need this job. Your mom, the doctor bills. He kisses the top of Julia's head. Back to work. You and me both. Julia sighs and reaches for her backpack. She removes a piece of paper, a bottle of water, and a small metal box. Homework first, George says, wagging a finger. Then you can paint. It's for art class, Julia explains. We're doing watercolors. I'm going to paint Ruby. George smiles. All right, then. Just don't forget your spelling. Dad? Julia asks again. Did you see Max's face when Ruby hit him? George nods. Yes, he says solemnly. I did. He shakes his head. Poor Mac. He turns away and only then do I hear him laughing. Colors. Colors. Julia opens the metal box. I see a row of little squares, green, blue, red, black, yellow, purple, orange. The colors seem to glow. She pulls out a brush with a thin tuft of a tail at its end. She dips the brush in water and wets the paper, then taps at the red square. 
When the brush meets the damp paper, pink petals of color unfurl like morning flowers. I can't take my eyes off of that magical brush. For a moment, I'm not thinking about Ruby and Mac and the claw stick and Stella. Almost. Julia touches red again, then blue, and there, suddenly, it is, is the purple of a ripe grape. She touches the blue and her paper turns to summer sky. Black and white, and now I see that she is painting a picture of Ruby. I can make out her floppy ears, her thick legs. Julia stops painting. She takes a few steps back, hands on her hips, gazing at her work. She scowls. Mm, it's not right, she says. She glances over her shoulder at me. I try to look encouraging. Julia starts to crumple up the paper, then reconsiders. Instead, she slides it into my cage at the spot where my glass is broken. Here you go, she says. A Julia original. That'll be worth millions someday. Gingery, gingerly, I pick up the paper. I do not eat a single bite of it. Oh, hey, I almost forgot. Julia runs to her backpack. She pulls out three plastic jars, one yellow, one blue, one red. She opens the jars and an odd, not food smell hits my nose. Julia pushes the jars one by one through the opening. Then she slides home paper through. These are called finger paints, she says. My aunt gave them to me, but really I'm too old for finger painting. I stick a finger into the red jar. The paint is thick as mud. It's cool and smooth like bananas underfoot. I pop my finger into my mouth. It's not exactly ripe mango, but it's not bad. Julia laughs. You don't eat it, you paint with it. She grabs a piece of paper and presses her finger on it. See, like this. I place my finger on a piece of paper. I lift it and a red mark is there. I get a bigger glob from the pot and slap my hand down on the page. When I pull my hand off the paper, its red twin stays behind. This isn't like a ghostly handprint, like the ghostly handprints on my glass, the ones my visitors leave behind. This handprint can't be so easily wiped away. A bad dream. I lie awake, peeling dried red paint off my fingertips. Bob, who accidentally walked on, walked on one of my paintings, is licking with red paws. Every so often, I glance over at the empty ring. The claustic glints in the moonlight. Stop! No! Ruby's frantic cries startle me. Ruby, I call. You're having a bad dream. You're okay. You're safe. Where is Stella? She asks, gulping air. Before I can answer, she says, never mind. I remember now. Go back to sleep, Ruby, I say. You've had a hard day. I can't go back to sleep, she says. I'm afraid I'll have the same dream. There was a sharp stick and it hurt. I look at Bob and he looks back at me. Oh, Ruby says. Oh, Mac. She puts her trunk between the bars. Do you think, she hesitates. Do you think Mac is mad because I hurt him today? I consider lying, but gorillas are ter terrible liars. Probably, I finally say. He ran away after that, Ruby says. Bob gives a scornful laugh. Crawled away is more like it. We are quiet for a while. Branches claw at the roof. Elied raindrums. One of the parrots murmurs something in her sleep. Ruby breaks the silence. Ivan, I smell something funny. He can't help it, Bob says. I believe she's referring to the finger paints Julia gave me, I say. What are finger paints? Ruby asks. You make pictures with them, I explain. Could you make a picture of me? Maybe someday, 
I remember Julia's picture, the one that will be worth a million dollars. I hold it up to the glass. Look, it's you. Julia made it. It's hard to see, Ruby says. There's not much moonlight. Why do I have two trunks? I examine the picture. Those are feet. Why do I have two feet? It's called artistic license, Bob says. Ruby sighs. Could you tell me another story? She asks. I don't think I can ever go back to sleep. I told you all I remember. I told you all I remember, I say with a helpless shrug. Then tell me a new story, she says. Make something up. I try to think, but my thoughts keep returning to Mac and his claw stick. Anything yet? Ruby asks. I'm working on it. Ivan, Ruby presses. Bob said you are going to save me. I, I search for true words. I'm working on that too. Ivan, Ruby says in a voice so low, I can barely hear her. I have another question. I can tell from the sound of her voice that this will be a question I don't want to answer. Ruby taps her trunk against the rusty iron bars of the door. Do you think, she asks, that I'll die in this domain someday, like Aunt Stella? Once again, I consider lying, but when I look at Ruby, the half-formed words die in my throat. Not if I can help it, I say instead. I feel something tighten in my chest, something dark and hot. And it's not a domain, I add. I pause and then I say it. It's a cage. The story. The story. I look at the ring layered with fresh sawdust. I look at the skylight at the half hidden moon. I just thought of a story, I say. Is it a made-up story or a true one? Ruby asks. True, I say. I hope. Ruby leans against the bars. Her eyes hold the pale moon in them, the way a still pond holds stars. Once upon a time, I say, there was a baby elephant. She was smart and brave, and she needed to go to a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Ruby asks. A zoo, Ruby, is a place where humans make amends. A good zoo is a place where humans care for animals and keep them safe. Did the baby elephant get to the zoo? Ruby asks, softly. I don't answer right away. Yes, I say at last. How did she get there? Ruby asks. She had a friend, I say. A friend who made a promise. How? How? It takes a long time, but finally Ruby returns to sleep. Ivan, Bob whispers, yawning. What you said about the zoo, how are you going to do that? Suddenly I feel as if I could sleep for a thousand days. I don't know, I admit. You'll think of something, Bob says confidently, his voice trailing off as his eyes close. What if I don't, I ask, but Bob is already asleep. His little red feet dance, <laughs> and I know he's running in his dreams, remembering. Bob and Ruby sleep on. I don't sleep. I think about the promise I made to Stella and the pictures I've made for Ruby. And I remember, I remember it all. What they did, what they did. We were clinging out, we were clinging to our mother, my sister and I, when the humans killed her. They shot my father next. Then they chopped off their hands, their feet, their heads. Something else to buy. Something else to buy. There is a cluttered, musty store near my cage. They sell an ashtray there. 
It is made from the hand of a gorilla. Another Ivan. Another Ivan. When morning comes and the parking lot glimmers with dew, I see the billboard on the highway. There I am, the one and only Ivan, bathed in the pink light of dawn. I look so angry with my furrowed bro, brow and clenched fists. I look the way my father did, the day the men came. I am, I suppose, a peaceful sort. Mostly I watch the world go by and think about naps and bananas and yogurts and raisins. But inside me, hidden, is another Ivan. He could tear a grown man's limbs off his body. In the flicker of time it takes a snake's tongue to taste the air, he could taste revenge. He is the Ivan on the billboard. I stare at the one and only Ivan, at the faded picture of Stella. And I remember George and Mac on their ladders, adding the picture of Ruby to bring new visitors to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade. I remember the story Ruby told, the one where the villagers came to her rescue. I hear Stella's kind, wise voice. Humans can surprise you sometimes. I look at my fingers, coated in red paint, the color of blood, and I know how to keep my promise. So this will be where we leave off for this part six of our uh, book study of The One and Only Ivan. Stay tuned for more videos where we're gonna go ahead and continue um, seeing what is going on with all of these amazing characters as the story continues to unfold.